everyone. Today we are talking about what it means to be under contract in a real estate transaction. Yep. All right. So we're gonna, we, Dylan and I are here, we were kind of brainstorming on the, we wanna hit the high points of what it means to be under contract, starting with the binding. So a lot of clients are like, what does it mean binding? What do you mean binding date? So you wanna talk a little bit about binding date? Sure. Yeah. So uh, when you offer on a house, whether you have two, three different counters with the seller, if you're the buyer, or if you're the seller, if you have two or three different counters with the buyer, however many counters it takes or whatever it takes to get a contract, the seller and the buyer are both agreeing on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we say a binding contract, one of the agents, whether it be the selling agent or the buyer's agent, literally binds the contract and it's signing a part underneath all the signatures, which officially makes that a legal document. Yes. And something else that it does that a lot of people don't don't quite understand is it starts the trade clock timeline. Yes. So all of the contingencies built in the contract and all of the contingencies that you've added to the contract, that timeline starts now. You want to talk a little bit about the contingencies? Right. I'll talk about some of the contingencies. So the first thing is the earnest money. So you and your agent have talked about with the seller how much earnest money you are going to send to uh, the address listed on the contract. So usually that's within three to five days. If you're an out of town client, then you may want to leave a little bit of wiggle room there with the snail mail or how you're going to send it uh, to the, the address that's listed on the contract. But earnest money is important. That's the first thing. Uh, we always uh, have our uh, clients write a check or send a money order and we turn it directly straight to our office. Usually they will hold it for about 14 days. So just kind of keep that in mind as well. But earnest money, that time clock ticks whenever that, that contract is bound. Yep. Right after earnest money uh, is kind of two go hand in hand. It's your financial contingency and your inspection contingency. So your financial contingency, if you're getting a loan, that'll obviously hold you throughout the whole time you're under contract. Say for whatever reason, you know, get a week before closing and your lender comes to you and says, hey, you can't, you know, we can't make this work. You know, we saw something we didn't see. Obviously, you would get your earnest money back mm -hmm. um, because it still falls under that financial contingency. Your inspection contingency um, has kind of two built into it as well. Your inspection and your resolution period. So inspection contingency with me, I typically give about two weeks, 14 days for inspection con contingency and another seven days for resolution. Mm -hmm. And an inspection contingency means basically you have those. In my case, I normally try to give 14 days. You have 14 days to get an inspector. Right. When you get the house inspected after that starts your resolution period. Right. As soon as you receive a copy of the inspection report, then you have seven days to start that resolution period. Technically, whenever your agent sends the repair replacement proposal, and that's a document that goes over the what you want your seller to fix. Mm -hmm. um, and then right after that, it jumps into the appraisal. Once inspection is cleared, typically the lender likes to wait for the inspection period to be, you know, good, agreed on, satisfied, you know. Uh, repairs being done or if you accepted the house as is to then or the appraisal and the appraisal is a guy that comes out and deems the value of your house right and and one of the things going back to uh the inspection period you know if, if it says 14 days on your contract that's the 14 days that you know that you have two weeks to get those done if you are planning to do other inspections uh, like have surveys or soil tests or any of those kinds of things then you would talk to your agent about maybe extending that time period. You and the seller would have to agree on that. So just keeping in mind that everything is a time crunch once it's, the contract is bound and ready, you know, you need to have those dates in mind of, you know, how many days do I have for this? How many days do I have for my inspection period, um, the appraisal and, and, and such? Yep, absolutely. And to kind of back it up a little bit, even talking about earnest money, I get asked a lot, what is earnest money? What does that do? Is that just what is it? Am I just yeah. giving money to the seller just for? <laughs> so earnest money is a good faith deposit. It's showing the seller your interest in the home. So if I have a client that is super, super interested in a home, they don't want the home to go, and let's say it's a $250,000 house, just throwing numbers out there, I'd probably suggest them to go somewhere around that $2,500 for earnest money because it shows them, wow, yeah. you know, that's a lot of money. Typically, it'd be about $1,000 is what I would. Yeah, about 1% to 2% of the, the purchase absolutely, price. Of the purchase price, absolutely. Yeah. But that earnest money then goes towards your closing costs. So it's no money that's ever lost. 
Um, that's why if you were to back out of a contract, you want to make sure it's on one of these contingencies so you don't lose that earnest money. Right, exactly. So, yeah, I think we pretty much covered the contract. Of, you know, you will go over the contract and its specificities, specificities <laughs> with your agent to make sure that you understand all of those contingencies and inspection periods, time crunch, uh, and what all those mean. Uh, there, there's also amendments that can be made if, you know, if, especially with the closing date, if the closing date doesn't add up or there's something uh, that happens that, you know, you need to change that date, we can do an amendment and everybody agree on changing the date either sooner or, or later. So. Yeah, yeah. And these aren't the only contingencies your offer or the contract can have. Uh, you can add contingencies by going into the special stipulations part of the contract, talking to your, 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 uh, your realtor mm -hmm. in this market, especially you can be contingent on selling your home and still be under contract with the right. house. You don't have to sell your house to buy another house. Your offer can be contingent. Right away. <laughs> yeah, right away. Your offer could be contingent on the sale of your home to purchase another home. Right. So basically that gives you a safe umbrella knowing that, hey, if I don't sell my house, I'm not buying another. But if you give me this dollar for my house and I sell it, I'll buy another. So mm -hmm. it gives you that, mm -hmm. that, that reassurance that you know that you're not gonna be homeless. Right. So, and especially in this market uh, where things are sitting a little bit longer than normal, you, that's definitely uh, a good strategy to use. And there's a lot of other contingencies that a good mm -hmm. agent who knows what they're doing could, uh, could put in there to benefit either the buyer or the seller. Right. One of the contingencies that I put in, um, you know, I have a client who was wanting to purchase land and build a house. So one of the contingencies that we had to add in there was that the land had to perk for a three bedroom house. So make sure that that land is gonna perk and be able to build a house and have a septic tank put on there. And so, you know, you have to get in touch with the soil scientists and all of those things. So um, just making sure that those contingencies are uh, ones that you want to put in there and the seller accepts it. And then once everybody is in agreement, then we sign and bind it. So. Yep, yep. And contingencies can be almost anything. Uh, whatever your client, if you're a realtor or if you're uh, someone trying to purchase a home, you talk to your realtor, but anything that you feel that you need an extra safety net on probably could be used as a contingency. That's right. For example, I had clients that say, hey, I don't want to move into this neighborhood mm -hmm. unless it's contingent on being able to have an above ground pool. Or, hey, I don't want to move into this neighborhood unless it's contingent on me being able to have a storage unit, but it doesn't have to look just like the house. Mm -hmm. So an agent's job is to look at the HOAs, look at the restrictions, make sure that's possible. But I always like adding that in the contract to give them that safe net. Right, right. All right, well, we hope that some of this information is helpful to you and understanding uh, what it means to be under contract. And you can contact either one of us, Press Savior Croft with Crawlett Realtors or- Dylan Morales. Dylan Morales here at the office, or you know, we've have, uh, we can leave our contact information at the end of this video, but we'd love to help you and help walk you through all of the stages of a contract. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.